I don't know what I'm gonna do. Five to rent, rent, food. I don't know what I'm gonna do. On World Day of Refugees, the UN announced that there are 70.8 million forcibly displaced people throughout the world. Johannesburg, in particular, is a real magnet for people who need to find a way to have a safe life and to care for themselves, and especially for their children. Because living where they are becomes an untenable choice. We have counted in 2011 approximately 2.1 million foreign-born persons in South Africa. The foreign-born population now stands at approximately 3.6 million persons. We can assume that the city of Johannesburg is probably slightly over 600,000, but most certainly less than 750,000. But this includes uh, people who are documented and undocumented. We are here not because it's a choice. We are here because there's violence in our country. When you see people running, you also go, you follow, you are scared. No one wants to die in this world. We came to South Africa knowing that things can get better than home. And then you find yourself in another prison. We are like trapped, we are like in, in jail, in prison here in South Africa. Certainly any person fleeing his or her homeland because of persecution, because of violence, is a vulnerable person during that time. Women's vulnerabilities are often greater, are usually greater. I think the fundamental thing that changes hearts and minds, however, is actually coming to know a refugee, listening to her story, understanding why she made the choice to sweep up her children and oftentimes flee in the middle of the night looking for safety and shelter. If I'm going to go back against the Burundi, they're going to kill me or something. So I didn't go back again. Police killed my father. He came to fetch him inside at night. I didn't see even the board for the, my father. So I go in my mother, I jump, I go to South Africa, and I lost my mommy. I have 10 years here, South Africa. My husband is going to Burundi even now because the passport was expired. Police fetch him to town. We take him to Lindela, Lindela until Burundi. So even now my husband, he don't have money to coming back again. So I see life is not easy to me. I was a political uh, uh, actor, so I was not uh, safe in Congo. That's why I ran away from Congo to come to South Africa. I came here on my own. I don't have uh, any uh, relative, any uh, connections here. In Congo, I have a family. I have a wife and kids. I left them there. Emotionally, I was very down because my family is very far from me and uh, I nearly went into a depression. When the war started in Congo, my mother sent me to the market. I saw people running, soldier was killing people. At home there were no one, I didn't find my parent. So I also started running. When we reached in Tanzania, it was not easy for a girl. We didn't know where to get food. Some of them, they were selling their own body. I found a sister. I used to work for her. To be a refugee is not easy. Me and the sister, we came to South Africa using a truck, like we didn't have a passport or anything. When we reached in South Africa, we went to Benvenue Shelter. There we stayed for three months. We moved with the sister. The sister got a boyfriend. I used to work for her, like selling sweet on the street. And when I asked for the sister, like, I want to go to school, she would tell me, I brought you here so you can work for me. Sometimes she can give me the food. Sometimes she make me sleep outside. One day, she chased me away. I went to GRS. I stayed there for eight years until when I finished my matric. My dad have 33 wives and my mom is the fourth wife. I was forced to a marriage when I was 14 years old. The man I was forced to marry was 38. He fight me, beat me, and it was rape. Then I fall pregnant and I give birth to a girl and they take away the baby without, I never breastfeed the baby. And then they was abusing me. I tried to talk with my dad that I don't want to be in the marriage, but never listened to me, say that he would kill me or do anything to me if I tried to run away from the marriage. <laughs> he kept raping me, beating me. 
Sometimes I think that if I die, <laughs> think it will be better. <sighs> then I attempted to poison myself. They took me to the hospital. So then I tried again that I wanted to kill myself. I took the rope that I'm going to hang myself, but to save me again. So I came to South Africa with my dad. I went to Pretoria, we went to the doctor, and then I decided to run away. When I was out of cash, I didn't know where to go. I was uh, an observer of uh, the election in DRC, and I ran away because they were arresting all the people who were observing the election. So I came here only with my passport. I didn't have clothes to change. I didn't have money. I can't go home because I knew that they will arrest me at the airport. I can't go to see my father. And I'm the only son of my father. He's sick, but I can't go there. I'm just like trapped. That is paining me every day. When I, I think about it, No, but it's so painful, it's so painful. I came in South Africa since 2004, and by that time I was 14 years old. There was a war, so I don't even know where my father went. And I have siblings, but I don't know where they are. I don't even know whether they are alive or they've passed away. I choose South Africa because I see South Africa is safe in the DRC. My mother and my father passed away. My brothers passed away. And uh, the husband also passed away. And when I came in South Africa, 2004, they said, no, you're gonna come with the truck. They put me inside on top. Like three days, I was there inside that truck. And they crossed the border and we come here, South Africa. And when I come here, I see the challenge is very, very difficult. But I was able to work hard. But now it's come difficult for me. They come with the stress. I came in South Africa 16 years ago. My life was a target. I worked for CNN and BBC, as well as as the Time magazine at that time. Uh, my house got bombed. So what I did actually is to start preparing my exit of that country. The soldiers come, took me with my child, the girl one and she put me in the truck and you will go with me too far. I didn't know the place. In this room, we, we was many women. I stayed there in a long time. Every day the soldiers come and it violates me, it violates me every time. And the different soldiers come like this. If uh, I want something, the water, he can't give you. You can't eat nicely. You can't wash. If I'm alone, I cry, I cry. If I see just the soldiers, I'm just keep quiet because I don't like to kill my child. One day when soldiers come, he tell me, I know your father. I can help you, but just keep quiet. He took me and we go, we go. I didn't know. He told me, here, you are free. And I was pregnant for four months. And we go, we come, still here. The majority of migrant and refugee women and the children, once they're settled, they tend to have these flashbacks and all the trauma that is revisited again. We then have to really work with their mental well-being. This also can take many months. It's a combination of attending to those particular needs, post-traumatic stress syndrome, but I think also very critically is helping those same women have a future, an opportunity for a way to support themselves and support their families. They're almost always with families. The decision to come to South Africa isn't taken lightly. People come here because they are fleeing horrible, horrible circumstances. And most of them are just trying to eke out an honest living. We struggle hard, you see that, because we don't have a, even a job, work, so we hustling hard. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm selling sweet and cigarette around town. Now I'm trying to work, it's not easy for me to get a job. So that's why I decided to get married, so I can get a place to stay. 
and food to eat because in South Africa life is very hard. Life now is is too much hard. Sometimes I get a something, small something, I eat it. You cannot but be moved uh, by young people, strong, who would be, could be making a contribution. And, and yet prisoners, prisoners of their own situation, not of their own making, but of society. I went to university, I got my degree in accounting science, but finding a job is not easy with these uh, papers. Every time you go, you can apply, you fill the requirements. By the end of the day, they'll ask you to be a South African citizen. When it comes to, to the job, it's really a challenge because you will see all the requirements for a job, a proper job. They will say that they don't need people with asylum or refugee status. I am invisible in South Africa, actually. Because every time you show that kind of paper, then the, everyone, someone will just ask you a question, what is this? I think I don't have a hope, actually. I lose hope. Who am I? A nobody. A nobody. It was hard to get enrolled to the school because the school, they need the report for the where you come from and they need a paper asylum for you to start schooling. When you run from war, you don't carry your passport or your report from the school. So I didn't have anything. I didn't know how to start. In DRC, I was a businessman. Sometimes when you're looking for a job, it's not, very, it's not easy for you as a, as a foreigner to find a job here in South Africa. I've lost a lot of things. By the time they come out of that situation, if they do, they will be extremely damaged. And we always speak in the church about human dignity. And yet we are unable to help them back onto their feet. We are destroying part of ourselves. Comparing our foreign-born population to other countries, South Africa's foreign-born population is actually very low. There's been a, a lot of confusion and misunderstanding about migration figures in South Africa. There seems to be a, a perception that a lot of the statistics are only looking at people who have some kind of permit or who, are, who are in a country legally uh, and that they are not including um, undocumented and that this undocumented is a huge group, which it absolutely is not. Unfortunately, this has led to a lot of the violence that we see on, on the streets. One of the misperceptions is that foreign nationals are committing crime, that foreign nationals are taking jobs. Studies in many parts around the world have actually found that these perceptions are incorrect and that actually local um, people are usually more responsible for a lot of the crime, especially violent crime, where there's a, a significant amount of a foreign-born population. For every one foreign-born employed person, he or she creates employment for two South Africans. I see xenophobia as a form of scapegoating. And I think, unfortunately, scapegoating is part of the human condition. There are always a number of challenges, a number of problems, often exacerbated by poor leadership, which has led to poor economic opportunities for many people. People are afraid, and understandably. Certain political leaders realize they can take advantage of the situation by fueling those flames. And that sort of anxiety, I think, fuels a lot of disruptive and, frankly, evil behavior. There might be a social problem, but the person to blame is the migrant. The person to blame is the refugee who has started a business, who doesn't speak the language that I speak. Migrants and refugees come to the church in South Africa. They bring the reality of diversity that enriches the local African church. But unfortunately, that beautiful experience is marred, uh, disturbed, and soiled by this whole conflict of xenophobia. I think at times we rightly criticize the media for the type of coverage they give to issues around refugees and migrants. Nothing sells like bad news. So to create a narrative, inconsistent as it might be, that blames the stranger, it's a very good strategy. It's a very good political strategy, even in terms of trying to get votes. Because a lot of times the media gets their information from people who want those negative stories out. The media has contributed to these perceptions by publicizing statements without actually confronting them and interrogating the statements. 
the media can and should do a lot more um, in terms of reporting on migrants and um, working towards social cohesion. In Johannesburg, we've seen very violent xenophobic attacks. But in the run-up to these attacks, for months, politicians, other public officials have been making extremely xenophobic statements. When you do that, you encourage people to loot, to destroy other people's property. I don't think that our government has been playing a critical role in trying to quell, in trying to reduce, dampen the levels of conflict. South Africans use migrants as an excuse for the shortcomings of their own society, their own municipality, their own national government. Some of these people are no longer outsiders. They've been here since 1994, more than 20 years. We have been so privileged, and yet we seem to have forgotten all that in this city. There is no will from South African government to, to integrate refugees in a South African society. Everything that they are doing is to oppose migrants, refugee and asylum seekers community to the local. Refugee and asylum seeker migrants, they are abandoned by themselves. We are attacked by citizens of South Africa, so we are not safe. They burning their cars, you see, their shops. It's not good that they, they do here. Many people, they don't have hope in South Africa. They are not safe anymore. Even myself, I'm no longer thinking that uh, it's better to live in, in South Africa. When they see that you are foreigners, they can treat you at any hour. Because I can't speak the language, you know that I'm a foreigner, so you can treat me this way. They just treat you as ah, makwere kwere, you are just a foreigner, this is not your country. It's what we, we go through every single day. We are scared to death. They say we steal ladies, we steal job, we bring drugs. The migrants that are here, that have got spaza shop, where's the job that she has stolen? She has created xenophobia, Afrophobia is really a disgrace to us as humanity. It's not just about the migrants, but it's about all of us. When they arrive here, what are we doing to welcome these people? We need to look at individuals as people, not about a number, not about where they've come from. The political rhetoric about refugees and forcibly displaced people these days isn't positive. If we get caught up in that, if I get caught up in that, it's pretty depressing. The church has had a lot to do in terms of responding to this, and the response has definitely started with Pope Francis. He has been a tireless spokesperson on behalf of migrants and refugees, internally displaced people, and trafficked people, especially young women. I don't think there's anybody who's been more consistent in his saying that we are part of the human family, and how we treat migrants and refugees very much says what kind of a people we are. What the church seeks to do is to offer some kind of minimal relief. First, at the practical level, in terms of charity, providing food and at times even providing clothing. On the other hand, because of the oppressive nature of the conditions under which people find themselves, a spiritual support is also important. They receive counseling simply to keep afloat as human beings. We hope that in each parish we will have a desk for migrants and refugees. Essentially, we seek to conscientize local communities that they ought to become welcoming communities. And you can only do that when you already demonstrate the ability to work together with people who come from outside your city. There is no quick solution. The challenges are huge and complex. It's not necessarily a problem that needs to be solved, but rather an opportunity that needs to be managed. Being an asylum seeker for 13 years is not just easy. There's still hope for us to bring change in Africa, and South Africa has a big role to play. We are all Africans. We are all human beings. This is like my home. I grew up here in South Africa, in Johannesburg. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I said thank you to God because I'm, I'm still alive and my son, my children is still alive, I said thank to God. The only thing that is left to you is hope and dream for a better life.